Hello, oh, hey, how you Frank doing? Mylar. Yeah. Hey, you got time for some quick yeah, questions? Absolutely. We've got a few minutes to kill here. So mm -hmm. let me just uh, set this down. Yeah. Here you go. Yeah. So let's, uh, speak into that really quick. Can you, can we yes, hear you? Uh, can you hear me? It sounds like Is we can hear you, yeah. Great. Okay. Hey, I'm Adam Bartholomew. Nice to meet you. I'm, nice a, meet you. I'm a state delegate down from Payson. Oh, great. So, so you're just doing this on your own? Yeah. You're not like a news thing. No. Well, the awesome. party asked me to just do what I can, so I'm just yeah. trying to, and none of my none of the people in my precinct can make it out to these events, yeah. so I'm just trying to get the word out. Nice. nice. But I had some, uh, I put out on Facebook in the delegate groups some, uh, what would what would people want to know from, yeah. from their, you know, potential attorney general? Sure. And so I got a couple questions here. Absolutely. First one uh, from someone named Patty. She said, "Will you work with our hope, with our governor to change the loopholes in our existing laws that make us by default a sanctuary state?" Um, yes, absolutely. Uh, I've been actually asked this before. Uh, but first of all, I need to correct something because we are we have a sanctuary city, which is Salt Lake City, and they declare that themselves. Um, we're we're not now declared a sanctuary state, but we're some. I think we're being treated like it. Okay. So, but I will fight this. I will fight something that's more important that wasn't actually mentioned in that question. I will work with the legislature to make it a felony to bring any illegals into the state. You know how many air flights and bus rides there's going to be if they know they're going to be arrested by the sheriff's offices every time they enter this state. It'll cut it down to zero. So I will actually work with them to do that. I have a plan of how I'm going to fight this whole illegal alien stuff. What do you do with uh, just kind of expanding on that? What do you do with the people that have been here? They've they've bought a home. They are you know uh, contributing to the economy. They're working. They're not breaking our laws. They're paying our taxes, and they have a driver's privilege card from the state of Utah. Well, first of all, I do not think that you should have privileges that are associated with being a citizen. Okay. Um, and everyone should go through the legal process. It's really not fair when somebody is trying to go through the legal process and they're waiting outside this country um, to be able to allow that to happen. However, practicality says all the criminals need to go immediately. It's nonsense when we have so many dangerous criminals coming into our state and it's because Biden is letting them cross that southern border. So we absolutely have to take measures and pass laws that will allow us to expel those individuals from our state. So that's, a, that's a, something I get from a lot of people when this comes up is like these people are here because of our broken system. Yeah. So like what are we how do we uh, how do we take that into account when they're they've, they've taken on a mortgage, they're buying it, they bought a house. Yeah. You know, illegal immigrant status, uh, you know, uh, they've got a car loan. They're, you know, they're working a full-time job. Like, what do we do with those with those people? Well, like I said, right now, we we, we have to get rid of the bad guys. <laughs> yeah. That's who you go first. We don't go after those guys first when we have so many bad guys that we need to get rid of. True. You know, that's the bottom line. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Uh, she also says, will you work with our... Uh, Will you work with our legislators to secure our elections and demand voter ID, in-person, paper ballot voting? I've already done that, actually, even for the state convention. I ask that that is the only thing that we trust right now. Um, electronic and iPhones are not verifiable and reproducible and auditable. And until we can get to that where we 100% know that it can be reviewed, audited, recounted, we should not use this fancy technology. I've already asked for it. I sent three emails out asking the state party to require paper only for the convention. And That's, I am a convention only candidate, great. by the way. I, res I, ex I respect that as a, as a delegate. Thanks. So, Does the attorney general have the authority to audit our elections? <laughs> this is a great no. And this is only said by somebody who's trying to fuel passions through their words and they don't have substance to it. Because the, the a candidate that keeps saying that has no clue to what the AG's office does. We cannot audit. We don't have authority to audit. The state auditor audits. However, I can review the election results. I can prosecute, more importantly, election fraud. To, to prosecuting every piece of election fraud that comes across our desk at the AG's office. Do you, is there a way for the AG to... Um make sure like if we're not auditing our elections and we have an auditor we haven't done anything like that uh let's say 
the, the, the voter rolls are out of date by a certain percentage. Is there anything that AG can do to step in there and yeah. make sure things are being done? Absolutely. So I have the power of being in the position that I have. I have the ability to call out anything that would be a constitutional problem or a violation of state law. I can call it out, announce it, have a press conference and call it out saying we need to change this. And they'll listen to me when I do that. The problem is too often our AG is silent and doesn't come out. COVID is an example. I never heard anything from our AG about COVID. And yet there were very significant constitutional issues that people came to me about regarding getting religious exemptions for the vaccine. I helped people do that free of charge. That's why people can trust me as AG because I've helped people vindicate so many constitutional rights without charging them a dime while I have my own private law practice. Great, thank you. Got time for a couple more? Sure. She also says, uh, I'll let, oh, okay. Here's another one. Some Melissa asks, um, how do charges of conspiracy and interference, um, if, I don't know what that, what this is supposed to mean, sorry. You know, it looks like we're going to get started here. Hang on. Thank you. Okay. Well, thanks for that for the Thank time, Frank. Much. I appreciate it. Are you going to publish this in some way? Yeah, we're going to uh, put all this out there. I can send you a link if you want. So, great. Thank you. That was Frank Mylar. Looks like they're people. Rachel, you got a second? Yes. Hey, Adam Bartholomew. I'm a state delegate from Payson. Okay. I, I, uh, here, you want to hold that? Okay. I, uh, I got you live here on Facebook Hi. in the delegate groups. Okay. And I put out a question to uh, to delegates. What would they want to ask the attorney general? Okay. So I got a couple questions. But, um, I love One that, that a lot of people this. asked was, uh, the legislature has put out a few bills regarding, this is from somebody named Melody, a few bills regarding sensitive materials or what many refer to as porn in school libraries. Yeah. Schools, districts, etc. seem mostly unwilling to enforce it. And so the content has remained largely the same. Uh, can the AG enforce those laws by suing and or by other means? And can he or she or will he or she hold the schools accountable? So one of the problems for why uh, school districts haven't been effectively complying with these is because it got they got inconsistent advice from the Attorney General's office. There were two different letters giving interpreting those statutes and a lot of those uh, I don't think there's as much wiggle room in the interpretation in light of the changes to the legislation. So what I will do as the Attorney General is give them clear and express direction on how to comply with state law. The other thing I will offer to them is is cover so that a lot of schools are afraid to act because they think they're going to be sued by the ACLU but now the legislation expressly provides that the attorney general can protect them so unless it's covered by insurance or a statute the attorney general's office cannot represent school districts so they've been really nervous about how to move forward because they don't have the the legislate or the litigation protection now the attorney general's office can protect them so they can move forward and they can uh, comply with the law. Okay. What if a school, like uh, if somebody had posted that Davis uh, School District still had some books that were found to be, uh, you know, some of them are really graphic, like showing, you know, mm -hmm. sex acts and stuff like that in the, in the illustrations or describing, um, you know, rape of a minor from the rapist perspective, kind of in a celebratory way. It's awful. You know, that the books are still in the library. Was that some? Would you be able to hold the, the schools accountable for not enforcing the law that's been passed? No, that's not how that works, um, unfortunately. And so, and anyone who tells you differently doesn't understand the dynamic with the attorney general's office. But what we can do is, when an individual brings that um, to the school district and they are failing to comply we can help those school districts comply. And we will go guide and direct them in the compliance. Okay. We don't prosecute the schools. We, however, provide them legal advice in these contexts to help them comply. And I've done that many times where there was a lot of misunderstanding on how they should do it. This isn't something that's new to me. I have sat with superintendents, sat with their attorneys and said, look, this is how this works. Let's get it done. And it's been very effective. Okay. Um, got time for another one? Sure, one more. Uh, the question was about affordable housing, and uh, a lot of communities feel like they're being forced into it from some Obama-era policies. 
that have uh, mandated a certain percentage of affordable housing um, or high high density uh, low you know low income housing. I don't know exactly what it is, but do you support that? And uh, would you uh, would you be able to push back against the federal government in those requirements? Yes. So one of the things the Attorney General's office is supposed to be doing is fighting federal overreach wherever it pops up. Obviously, that takes a lot of time and resources, and so we pick our battles. But when it comes to housing, it comes to protecting Utah's resources, Utah's families, Utah's communities, that is a key part of what the Attorney General's office can and should do. Okay. Um, all right. Do you support those kind of policies in general? Like, uh, the, uh, the affordable mandated, housing? The mandated uh, high-density housing units that are being kind of forced into... If you build a certain number of single-family homes, you have to build a certain number of high-density units. I believe that city, well, that governments closest to the people work best in making those decisions. Those should be at the city level and the county level, and the legislature trying to push down how that works on cities is unhelpful. Okay. All right. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. I yeah, appreciate you running. Derek. Anyway, hey, thank you. It's good to meet you, bro. Hey, you got a second to go on the record? Hey, sure. For what issue? Uh, you're, I got you streaming on the delegate groups oh, hey. on Facebook, and uh, we had a, I submitted some inquiries to the groups, wanted to get some questions from delegates and uh -huh. um, what they would want to ask. Do you want to hold that real quick? Yeah. What's your name again? My name is Adam Bartholomew. I'm precinct chair from Payson. Thanks, Adam. Yeah. You're all the way up. What? Uh, just a precinct chair down in Payson. Okay. Yeah. So we're just streaming to the, to the Facebook groups for the delegates. Yeah. Okay. So what questions yeah. The question was, uh, the state legislature has passed a few bills regarding sensitive materials or what people call porn in schools. Right. The and, library, the library yeah. issue, exactly. And school districts uh, seem to be mostly unwilling to enforce it, and the content has remained the same. It's, uh, there was some... Some people posting about how some of the books that were found to be violating that policy are still in, like, Davis School District, for example. And so yeah. what she wanted to know was, can you enforce those laws by suing or other means, and will you be willing to hold schools accountable to get those, that content out of yeah, schools? I, I think we need, we, I need, we need to hold them accountable, but it also needs to be consistent across the board. And the main person on this issue, by the way, is Ken Ivory. So I've talked with Ken. I've worked with Ken. And the trick is creating a standard that is uniform across the board. Because if you have a uniform standard, then you can actually enforce it in a way that you can't if it's not uniform. Hey, thank you for being here. <laughs> Appreciate it. Thanks for coming. Thanks so much. So, I mean, the answer is yes. Do we enforce it? Yes. And But you're right that the material hasn't necessarily changed. The standard has changed. And so okay. the, the, the issue really is how do you work with the school districts to make sure that they can implement it because what they need and this is the difficult part is from a legal standpoint you need clarity about the standard that you're implementing right and once you okay. have that kind of clarity and the consistency of the standard then you're able to enforce what it is that is in there okay right and i know that there will also be um i mean some of these groups and i've talked to some of these groups that are looking at actually filing suit against the state or against the individual school districts as well for the lack of consistent interpretation. So okay. that's that's something else that okay. needs to be looked at. So, so all right. Anyway. Can, can the, yeah. One more question real quick. Yeah. Can, can the Attorney General audit elections? No, it's not an audit position. But what the Attorney General can do is review the election code from top to bottom, have an investigations unit, and work with the clerks to make sure that the laws are being followed. Because really, it's less about auditing and looking backwards, and I think more about looking forward. How do we secure the system going from the year 2024 forward? And how do we create a system that makes sure that the clerks are actually following it? And so when I was the state party chair, one of my biggest concerns was Salt Lake County. Mm -hmm. So we actually had poll watchers in Salt Lake County in the clerk's office. And there were some times when they would push back. And I'd say, you know what, I knew what the law was. I knew what the code was. I knew what they had to do. And at one point they said, well, you can't really see X, Y, Z. I'm like, actually we can. State law gives us that right. And so what we need is to make sure that the county clerks in fact know that and follow it. And most of our county clerks, frankly, they, they do a good job. Mm -hmm. um, but the AG can work with them. And one of the other things, just as a side note, I don't know how many people know this, the lieutenant governor and the clerks, or the prosecutors in like Cache County and Juab, are prosecuting election fraud right now. So there's someone, uh, there's a third degree felony that's being charged for election fraud up in Cache County. 
and also a, a comparable charge down in Jew Evans. So one of, okay. the, one of the things that, that we need to do is work with and be a resource for those clerks because when they see issues like that, they need to go after them. Okay. Because we have to have security in our election yeah. system. So One other question right. I got specifically for you yes. was that uh, you're, I guess, endorsed by Spencer Cox. Is that right? He hasn't officially endorsed me. He hasn't no. officially? Okay. But, somebody uh, somebody he, said you were his pick. Well, you know what? If I am... <laughs> right, great. I'm. I'm. A so lot they of wanted to know how, here, how you're here's, gonna. Here's my answer. Uh huh. I'm endorsed by Mike Lee. Okay. So if you want to know, who's we like pick, Mike Lee. Whose pick I yeah. am? I've worked with Mike Lee. Okay. I've run his offices. I practice law okay. with him. Mike is. Mike knows the candidates in this race. Mm -hmm. Of all the candidates, he's selected me. He's endorsing me. I don't think he's endorsing anyone else in any other federal or statewide race. Okay. And so. You know, so what do you think about his push to like appoint the the attorney general's office? It's, it's a dumb idea, and frankly, it's not going to happen. I mean, like I've gone around the state. Every time this comes up, I always ask groups of people, like, "What? Hi there. What? What do you think about the issue?" And I have never met somebody who thinks it's a, cr a good idea. No, no, I take that back. I met an attorney once at a law firm, mm -hmm. and Mike McHale thought it was and, a great idea when well, I talked to him. I think Mike was, yeah, Mike, <laughs> Mike was stirring the pot. I think okay. he was trying to get people talking about it. But the reality is, um, it's just not going to happen. There was a bill that was sponsored to study this as part of other issues, and the bill didn't even get voted on. So not only does the legislature not want to do it, they don't want to study it. In fact, not only do they not want to study it, they don't even want to vote on whether to study it. Okay. So there's just no appetite anywhere. And what was funny, I was going to tell you the the one guy who liked the idea. When I was, I was, it was a lawyer at a big law firm, and I, and I'm like, do any of you think it's a good idea? And like, no one raised their hand. And then one guy goes, Yeah, I do. I'm like, really? I'm like, tell me why. <laughs> and do what he said. He said, I think it's a great idea because it works so well in D.C. with Merrick Garland. Hmm. And I went. <laughs> okay, then you and I are probably going to be on different ends of the political So you're endorsed spectrum. by Mike Lee? I am endorsed by Mike What do you think about Mike Lee as Attorney General under Trump 2.0? You know what? Mike would... Mike is a genius, and he and I respect him. He's a constitutional genius. He understands the Constitution like no one I've ever met. And whether he is on the Supreme Court or the Attorney General... Well, I could go for that. ...or a member of the yeah. state... Or, or the, uh, you know, the U.S. Senate... Mm -hmm. I mean, the reality is whatever he does, he excels at. I practiced law with Mike many years ago. We were in the same law firm. I saw him litigate. Like, we litigated together. I saw the way he thinks. The guy's a genius. Like, he's he's made for this kind of thing. Cool. All right, so well, thank great. you very much. Thank you. What was your name one more time? Adam here? Bartholomew. Adam, thank you. Yeah. Thanks for being here. Thanks yeah, for definitely. making the drive from... Yeah, it's uh, a long drive. ...from yeah. Mason. <laughs> that is a long drive. Right? My other state delegate can't make it, so, you know, we got to get the word out. I love it. Thanks cool. for doing it. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for being yeah. here. All right, we've got one more. Excuse me. Let's see if we can get Trent Christensen over here. Trent Christensen, how you doing? Adam, how you doing? Good, Good. to see you. Good to see you. Hey, uh, a couple questions for you. Yeah. I put out in the in the delegate groups um, some questions yeah. for, about what would they would want to ask the attorney general, mm -hmm. and one of the questions was about the the legislature has passed some bills recently about um, por essentially porn in schools, which yeah. is sen sensitive materials in schools, right. and the the districts seem to be largely uninterested in enforcing the new right. the new laws, and it, it came out that. Uh, some of these books that are really graphic uh, right. with either illustrations or descriptions uh, in the text are still in like Davis School District, right. for example. Oh, and so absolutely. the question was, are, are you, are, is the Attorney General able to enforce yes. that law? And uh, are you willing, like with lawsuits or whatever, and are you, are you willing to, if you're Attorney General, enforce absolutely. that law? So let me explain this first. The Attorney General sits at the top of every regulatory agency in the state, and that includes the State Board of Education, the county boards, all of them. Right? Okay? So the Attorney General doesn't just have the ability to do it. In my opinion, he's got the responsibility to enforce those laws, right? Legislature passes it, that's the law, okay, that's what we're gonna do. But here's a way that you do it, okay? Attorney Generals can write what's called an advisory opinion. Okay, I can go, I don't need permission to write it, I just can go do it and say, look, here's the law, here's what you have to enforce, 
and, and go give it to the board. But here's what they also do. Those advisory opinions serve as notice. So if I showed up as Attorney General to the Davis County School Board and said, look, I've seen what's happening. You're not following the laws. Here's an advisory opinion that says, I see you. I know what you're doing. You're not following the laws. And I'm going to be back here in three months, and we're going to check this. They are now on legal notice that they need to enforce these laws. And if they don't, there are repercussions. Because that's what's happening. They're not, a, they're not afraid of anybody. What happens if they don't follow the law? Nothing, currently, right? Because the Attorney General doesn't want to take that fight. Mm -hmm. That's an important fight for me. So you, you write those advisory opinions. You actually literally show up to the hearing with cameras in tow and say, this is what's happening. I see you. I know what you're doing. And I'm going to be back here in three months, and this had better change. Because if not, there are legal repercussions to what you're doing. Okay. And the Attorney General has full regulatory control, able to do that, doesn't need to get permission from the legislature, doesn't need to get permission from the governor, can just go and fix it okay. if he's willing. Okay. Uh, one of the other things was about uh, election integrity, and yeah. I know you've talked a lot about that um, in your your different appearances and stuff, and some of the other candidates have said no, the office, they, there are some things, but they cannot audit elections, and what, I know you, what you're saying, day one, we want to audit the elections. What do you mean by that, and is that something that uh, can actually be done by the yeah, Attorney General? I was really dismayed. Today was the first day I ever, ever disagreed with Frank Mylar. Um, I was dismayed by that. I really was. Look, when I say we're going to audit it, he says, well, no, you can't because that's the auditor's department. The auditor handles finances, right? And so, yeah, they would be a component of what I do. But look, we're going to look at all of it. I mean, call it what you want, an investigation, an audit, whatever. But we're going to dig into every component of election integrity, and we're going to make sure it works. And if it doesn't, we're going to get that data, and we're going to push the legislature to make a change. And if somebody's breaking the law, then we're going to arrest that person, right? Because I think that's happening in this state. In my personal opinion, it needs to go back to on paper and in person at election day, period, okay? But I can't just do that by fiat. I can't pass a law. We need the legislature's help. But for somebody to say, look, we can't do that, all that tells me is that they are either incapable or unwilling of doing the hard work to make sure that our elections matter. So I don't want to hear about semantics. Well, you can't audit. That's an auditor's department. No, they handle finances, right? Look, and I give this example a lot. Your smartphone, it didn't exist until it did, right? The Constitution didn't exist until it did. So don't tell me I can't do something. I'm going to create it, and we're going to enforce election integrity. And just for you to be like, well, that's never been done before. Well, guess what? I'm going to do it. And I'm going to make sure that my kids live in a state where we elect our leaders, not have them selected for us by other people. And, you know, Frank, maybe Frank and I need to sit down and have that conversation, you know, and I can help him kind of see the light on this. Yeah, that'd be one cool. Second, one, one, one second. Thank you, everyone, for coming. We just need to be able to wrap up now. Uh, but thank you all for coming. Thanks, man. Um, I come from, I grew up here, but I, I uh, lived in Washington State for 20 years. Okay, yeah. I watched it go from red to permanent blue lock. Yeah. And one of the biggest problems in King County was that the voter rolls were over 14% right. out of date. Right. And there's a lot of, there's a list, actually you can find it online, of houses that some of them have um, uh, close to 1,000 registered voters at a single family residence. And the, the list goes, there's hundreds of the houses on this list, and right. many of them have 200 to 400 registered voters at the address. Some of the registered voters are 124 years old. So the, the oldest people. That's amazing. The, the, most, the healthiest people and oldest people are living in Washington State. And, and let me ask you a question. Who's the only elected official that can go do anything about that in a state? The only one? The Secretary of State. Okay. You know, or the Lieutenant Governor here in Utah. Right, the Lieutenant Governor. They have the control over elections, right? But if it's happening and it's illegal, then whose domain does it fall in, right? If it's illegal, if someone's doing something illegal, then it becomes my job to fix well, it. Well, if you have a county that's uh, unwilling to clean up their roles that's or unwilling to do for. that, how, so how would that's you handle that? That's what subpoenas are So for. Salt Lake County is a very blue county. Right, right. If I say, look, you're breaking the law and I can prove that you are and I have enough to go off of, then we open an investigation. And I can put every single one of the county clerks under oath, subpoena them, put them under oath and do a deposition and have them answer questions under oath about what's happening. I can do it to them. I can do it to their staff, right? We can do it to all of them. But to your point about voter rolls, Utah currently employs this company. It's called Eric. A lot of people have heard about it. Yes. And they've study after study has shown that they're purposely making the problem worse, but we're sending them money, right? Utah is the only red state left using the service and everybody knows it doesn't work. So here's what I could do. It doesn't matter that they're not in Utah. I could sue them, right? I could demonstrate to the whole world that they're not working and end them, right? Not just get Utah out of it, actually crush it. Demonstrate that they're doing illegal things and end the entire thing. And that doesn't just benefit Utah, right? It benefits a lot of, I mean, this is what'll happen. The liberals will just come up with a new one, right? But at least we got Utah out of it, right? At least we did our job. 
Makes but sense. to say like, well, I mean, it's election integrity. Let somebody else audit it. You can't audit it. No, that's just telling me you're unwilling to take the step and fight that fight. Okay. Another thing you talked about real quick is uh, is illegal immigration. It yeah. is it is a state's issue. Uh, one thing that I get asked uh, routinely is, you have a lot of people who are here illegally because of our broken system, right. and now they have a Utah State driving privilege card. Right. They have they've taken out a mortgage. Right. They have a car loan. You know, they're working a full time job. They're paying taxes into the system. They're not breaking our law. What do you do with those people? Uh, you know, I, I know one thing what Trump has talked about is mass deportations of illegal immigrants. What do you do with those people that are that have that are uh, contributing to our system because because our system's broken? You know, what happens to somebody who's got a home mortgage? What happens yeah. to somebody who's working full-time, never broken a law, except for the one that they broke to get here? What do you right. do? Well, you have to start at the beginning of the problem, okay? And by that, I mean, it. Like we're talking about people that are here, that have mortgages. There are still millions of people, tens of thousands every day, coming across the border, right? And so if we wait to answer that question for another two years, all of those, a chunk of those people will have mortgages and all that sort of thing. You need to stop the inflow, right? So you need to start where you can start. And I made this point in this debate, right? Look, there's, there was an illegal that's been de detained and deported multiple times that got arrested in American Fork with 30 pounds of fentanyl. But we're not prosecuting him because ICE says we can't. So we're just giving in to the federal government and letting that happen, okay? So that's where you start. You take those people, you prosecute them using state law. And that was another thing that was a little, I wanna to get to your question, but it was a little dismaying. I heard another candidate say, well, I have to work with the legislature in order to do that. No, you don't. You can do it right now. There's state law in the books. You can enforce it right now. Don't tell me you got to work with the legislature or get permission from the governor. You enforce it now. And, th and then, so you stop, you stop the inflow of illegals, especially the criminals, right? Everything happening up I-15, all the drug trafficking, sex trafficking, child trafficking. You stop that first, right? You make them pick a different state. You secure Utah's border, okay? And then once you've done that, then yeah, you have to have this conversation. Like, have they broken laws? Well, they're here illegally, okay? So that's a conversation we need to have. But that's something where you have to get with, you know, the, the policymakers and say, okay, what are we going to do with that? You know, we've got the dreamers, all those different things. We've got to talk about that. And it's something that's important to me for this reason. My mom's an immigrant. She, she's from Argentina. She moved here in 1963. She naturalized in 68. So some of this language around immigration, it's really harsh. And a lot of it's offensive, right? And we don't need that. We can have, we can have calm solutions to these problems. You know, like, I'm the product of immigration. I'm proud of that, right? But it doesn't mean you don't enforce the laws, right? You still have to enforce the laws, and there still has to be something that those people go through in order to, to become legal immigrants. Nobody hates illegal immigration more than legal immigrants. Right? Oh, I know. My mom used to get so mad that we never had to pass the same test that she did to become an immigrant. Mm -hmm. She's like, you didn't, I had to study forever for that test, right? We don't have to do that. So there has to be something, right? There has to be some sort of process that they go through, and that might be deportation and they come back in. I mean, if there was massive you know, invasion of the border, then yeah, maybe there needs to be a massive deportation, right? It's a national issue, but it's also a state issue. But the AGs have got to be engaged now and stop the inflow where everything else we're talking about is academic. People with mortgages, blah, blah, blah. Well, guess what? There's fentanyl coming up by 15. So let's start there first. Makes sense. Yeah. I know as a, I employed a bunch of um, Mexican immigrants for, in a uh, car dealership in Seattle. Yeah. And one of the things they talked to me about was we, we had the conversation when Trump was running for office was they said that there's a lot of um, criminals that prey specifically on their communities. Mm -hmm. And we then we had a guy that got deported for some criminal activity and then he showed back up eight months later. He had come back across the border and he wanted his job back. Right. But he said, but you have to hire me under this name. He's got a new social security card, a right. new... You know, obviously, there's there's uh, some things happening behind the scenes that are kind of incentivizing this to you know to happen. Right. But how do we stop people from uh, you know like clearly with our our driving privilege cards and allowing the, the you know banking right. stuff like that? Right. We're incentivizing the no, people you're to come here. Right. You well, and my answer is elections have consequences, right? We have a current administration in this state, governor, that wants those things to happen, right? Like I, I just get frustrated when people are like, "We're not a sanctuary state." Yes, we are. If you walk like a duck and you talk like a duck, then you're a sanctuary state, right? And so as long as those policies stay in place, you're going to keep running into what we're talking about with, you know, the people that have the mortgages and stuff like that. That has to change. And the part of the role of a state attorney general, the state attorney general has a big bully pulpit. He can get up and talk and people will listen if he's willing to have these conversations and say, look, here's what's happening. These policies are leading to us being a sanctuary state. These policies are leading to more people when they cross the border coming to Utah, okay? They come to Utah, they don't go to Idaho, right? They come here because we have policies they like that make their lives better. 
and we got to fight these elections of these elected officials that want these things to happen. So if I'm if I'm arresting people with fentanyl coming to buy 15, then we have a conversation about that. We have a conversation about all the other policies that are allowing them to come. We have a conversation about what ICE is doing that's making it virtually impossible for our county sheriffs to enforce the law, right? And we push the issue. Why are we allowing these things? And the governor gets up because it's an election year and says, no, we're not a sanctuary state. We never will be. Well, just because you did give us the official declaration, the official designation as a sanctuary state, doesn't mean we're not. They're bringing, they're inviting this problem into this state. And that's what needs to stop first. Cool. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, man. Appreciate you running. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, Thanks, ya. everybody. All right, that's it. You shake a lot of hands, so. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in to Main Street Media Utah. Be sure to share this video with any delegates or people that are concerned about where our state is headed. Have a good day.